<laughs> Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's DM Radio, Where's the Data? Let Your Data Catalog Find It, sponsored today by Calibra. It is a deep dive and continuing conversation from a live DM Radio broadcast a few weeks ago, which if you missed, you can listen to it on demand at dmradio.biz under podcasts. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DMRadio. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn the webinar over to Eric Cavanaugh, the host of DM Radio, to introduce today's webinar and speaker. Eric, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome right back at to Shannon. Thank you so much. We're excited today to go deeper into the information architectures of today's businesses and try to figure out how to get a handle on all that stuff. It's getting more complex by the day. So the topic today, where is the data? Let your data catalog find it. I love data catalogs. I think they're going to save us from ourselves, quite frankly, but we'll get into that during the course of this hour. So I'm, host, I'm hosting today with Paul Brunet, VP of Product Marketing at Calibra. He's calling in from the greater New York City area. And like I said, it's one of my favorite topics. So this is one of my favorite stories of being in the business of information management. Years ago, I had the opportunity to do some consulting with the Chief Information Office for the Department of Defense of the U.S. of A., and a guy, a senior level guy over there was talking with me about what's going on with them and what their challenges are. And we got off on various topics and I started talking about work I had done back in 2005 to evangelize transparency and federal spending. Well, amazing things happened and about a year later or so, Congress passed a bill, the Senate passed a bill and the President signed the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006. And it just blew my mind, so I was telling the story to this gentleman, and he laughed, and he said, transparency? Oh, so it's your house where I should send that next predator drone strike. <laughs> he goes, you're out of your mind. I don't even know how many Oracle licenses we have around here. All right, now, this is the Department of Defense CIO's office, mind you. So it was just kind of a wake-up call, and his point was, it's very difficult to know what's out there. So if you don't know how many licenses you have, imagine what the data landscape looks like especially for an organization that's been around for a long time, you have all manner of legacy systems. You have all kinds of policies and rules and regulations that determine what can and can't be done. And as anyone who has dealt with that kind of situation knows, the more regulations, the harder life gets, and sometimes they even contradict each other, which makes life really interesting. So let's talk about information topographies. They are just wildly diverse these days, and it's getting more complex by the day. So how do you deal with that? Well. Frankly, in the past, we've had fairly manual efforts on trying to handle that kind of stuff. And then now with mergers and acquisitions, things get more complex. There are all these regulations. And even though GDPR really is for the EU and for citizens of the EU, you can pretty much rest assured that something along those lines is coming down the pike here in the U.S. of A. Of course, we do have the can spam law, for example. That means you can spam as long as you follow certain processes, like a remove list and so forth. But there are other regulations as well. HIPAA, of course, comes into play here, the Affordable Care Act. If you're in the healthcare industry, and I have an example of health data in a moment here, all these regulations combine to make the situation rather, I'd say, borderline urgent. If you don't have some way to see what data you have and then be able to map that data to business processes and know where things are going, you're going to be in trouble just for your business sake, but also in terms of regulation. So data lakes, well, what, you know, what have these things done? Theoretically, they were supposed to simplify where you host your data and how you host your data and make things less expensive. In reality, I think they've made things more complex because now we have a lot of these large data lakes that are relatively ungoverned, and that's going to make life even more challenging. Well, the bottom line here is that manual efforts to address this are just not going to work. We need automation. We need tools that can basically scan your information landscape, figure out what you have, and then allow you to piece together that picture as it makes sense for your company, for your organization. And that's where data catalogs come into play. So this is not a drill. This is an actual schematic of a healthcare operations information landscape. You can see a whole slew of different systems there, and all those arrows talk about data that's going various directions. Well, because of some of the regulations, they have really had to bend over backwards 
to get to a situation where they could understand who's who and how much do we send the bill for to which companies and which individuals. This is a serious deal. This is actually for revenue cycle management, which obviously is what keeps the fires burning at large healthcare organizations. Again, you can imagine with a, in a landscape this complex, knowing where the data is on any given patient, for example, is a real challenge. And being able to identify, they actually figured out that something like eight, 17, 18 million dollars are lost each year by this organization just in not being able to bill efficiently. It takes days, weeks even sometimes to reconcile individual patients and figure out who owes how much money. Uh, that, that got more complex just from my perspective after the Affordable Care Act in part because it's a whole bunch of new regulations. I don't know if you've noticed this, but a lot of times you go to the doctor these days and you try to pay them and they won't take your money. <laughs> they say, no, we'll send you a bill in the mail. Well, you know, for someone like me, that's bad news because I'm really bad about the post office. But anyway, long story short, this is a very complex information landscape. It's going to be very difficult to really get your head around these things. And governance, I promise you, is going to cause a whole lot more headaches for people who don't have their act together. Well, that's why we're talking about data catalogs today as a new way to help you incrementally build out a clear picture of what your information landscape looks like. This is one of my favorite slides. Then the data lake evaporated into the cloud. You know, we started with this whole concept of data lakes being the sort of be-all, end-all, single repository, large and infinitely scalable repository for your data. Well, that died pretty quickly. You even see the, the major vendors in that space have not only dropped using the word Hadoop, but they started using terms like data fabric or backplane, data plane, for example, if it's Hortonworks. And what the lesson here is, frankly, is that they've realized this one location massive repository for data dream is just not going to happen. And cloud, in fact, as Tony Baer, an analyst for Ovum, pointed out, is becoming the de facto data lake. So we're going to have these very diverse, very far-reaching environments with data across different clouds, on-premise, through partner channels, and so forth. And that means the process of getting that strategic view of which data lives where and who gets access to it is all the more important. And it's going to happen, I promise you. If things have to happen in business, they do happen. So this is one of my favorite slides of late. Any effort is going to require communication across departments. Key stakeholders need to be in the know. And because it's so serious, you really need to make sure that you keep people apprised of what you're doing and who's involved. This is all very important stuff. So don't keep your plans to yourself. That has been a tendency over the years for various reasons. But the vector of movement is definitely in the direction of collaboration, of open sea, of transparency, wherever it's required. And of course, obfuscation in areas like GDPR when you have to hide the data. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paul Brunet, who is going to take us through what Calibra has done and how data catalogs in particular are going to help us find data and catalog data and organize this stuff. So with that, Paul, take it away. Thanks a lot, Eric. You know, I, I, I appreciate the setup because I think you know, it, it really is a nice lead into. Um, it's funny nowadays what you do is you, you know, you did a good job of let, we, laying out the issues. Now what we're seeing is a lot of people say, "I need a data catalog. What is it?" <laughs> because we're hearing in the discussion, and we know a lot of the challenges that are, are out there. But one of the key the key issues and questions. So what is it, and, and what's the best way that I should be thinking about a catalog? It's going to solve you know, like all these different problems going on, going on, on out there. But I, what, what I usually like to do is I just like to start out and just saying, you know, like, why? What, what, is the, what is the motivational factor for this? You know, like, as much as we've been hearing for like the last five, seven, eight, ten years is the idea of the, about digital disruption. Um, but it's still happening, and it's still happening at a, at a greater degree of, uh, uh, to a broader degree across the different businesses. And this is a, an interesting thought that came out from, you know, from McKinsey, where they basically said, for, especially for established companies or, or the incumbents, that newer digital uh, companies based more, more so based on the digital model have already siphoned off 40% of an incumbent's revenue growth and 25% of their profitability growth. So therefore, what, you, what they really feel is that only 8% feel that their business model will remain viable going forward. Right, that, that's a, a very alarming number, and you can take a look across all the different industries, travel agencies, ride-sharing services, banking loans, cloud services, retail insurance, you know, just pick your industry, and you can really see. So like, we've always hold, hold up this idea, well, I've got to use my data. It's all about my data and my information and the like. And so what we started seeing is, you know, is the idea of as compared to locking down 
the, the idea of data is you know, how do we start freeing it? How do we start thinking about using our data much more from an offense approach as compared to a defense approach? And this was uh, Tom Davenport in, in, in HBR, you know, along with you know, um, the CDO from AIG, really came up on this idea that there's this look, if you think about it, between an offense and defensive structure, and then the idea is that I need control and I need freedom around the data, that there is this data sweet spot. And the idea of it is, is, is how do I get there? How do I make sure I need to really free up more of this data so I can have people use it in different ways? But because of many of the things that, that you know, Eric mentioned earlier was whether it be from a regulation perspective or some of these other ideas of privacy and the like that are coming up, how do I really think, think differently about this? And so you know, like we've been trying different ways. You know, like we, had, you know, like we had our centralized reporting. Well, we knew where that was. That was really about control and being very defensive about it. Then we started saying self-service analytics, that's going to free us up. That's really going to get us to where we want to. But it still you have to be very, very data savvy, and the tools and, 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 the, and the problems were like, very complex, and the idea, if it, they never really got to the masses. So then, as, we, as Eric mentioned, we went to this idea of data lakes. Put the, just put the data out there. Give it to everyone and let it be free. So you're really going on this idea of freedom. But what we did is we started creating other problems for ourselves. You know, like there is redundancy in the data. There is the veracity of the data. It's, it's uh, being manipulated and publishing the same thing with it being modified, but no one really knows where did it come from. And so what we found is in, in working with many of our clients is, and very much represented from this idea that just came up from MIT, is we've really created this engagement gap. And MIT does this yearly survey, and you can see on, you know, on the blue is that the idea of it is we've made the data, you know, it's out there, we've made it like uh, the data um, available, but the idea of that we can apply it and gain insights from it is actually going down. So much so that over these years, we've actually doubled the engagement gap. Our users don't know how to really take full advantage of all this data, and we'll get into what is the definition even of data going to go forward. And so we call this the data engagement gap. How do I really engage with it so I can really think about applying it? And this is the problem that you, I think organizations are really trying to solve. So if, what do you need a, why do you need a catalog? Well, you really want to solve this. You want to make sure the data is available, but it's used in a manner and it's applicable to the individual that wants to use the data. So, right, so we have this idea of data catalogs, right? It goes from a data lake, put the data lake into the catalog, and we're going to make it really usable, and we can then apply all these different types of analytics with it. But one of the things we we created issues for ourselves when we started creating these data, is we just took all the data and just dumped it in there. We didn't put a lot of color around it. We didn't understand the context of it. And we have lots of redundancy. So when we just take this data lake and put it into a catalog, yes, there's some structure and the ability of being able to find it becomes simpler. But we have information in there that is like, wrong. It's quality. We can't really judge the quality to the levels that we need to. Or we may be putting data in there that shouldn't be in there, especially as we talked about GDPR, privacy. And so that therefore, if people have access to data, maybe they shouldn't. And so therefore, it's really in, in, impeding our ability really to think about it from an overall value perspective and a value um, that, that we were really trying to drive. So w one of the things that we've seen is, you know, like, is for those that really got at the forefront of just let me go put into a catalog and they started seeing some of these issues. What we saw is, let me think about these two things together, governance and catalog. And the reason for it is it also allows me to think about, I could have the data lake, but why was the data put in there? Who put it in there? What was the reason for it? Not being overly, overly um, you know, like, um, complex about it, but let's make sure we understand the context of it, and therefore we can describe it a little bit better. We can make sure it's aligned to some kind of business initiative. And as once again, as Eric also called out, is the idea of integrating across these different pillars. So we can also reduce the amount of data we're maintaining. Because remember now, with GDPR and privacy, there is a liability with having this data around. So what you want to do is you want to start reducing the amount of data you have because you also want to reduce some of the liability, making sure you focus around that which is really important. And so you can think about this idea of just applying some basic governance to it, which reduces the number, and is really a way of getting more color around your data. And that's what we really refer to as the idea of understand. Then what a catalog can really think through is then the idea of putting structure on it. You can really find what's relevant to me. And you really want to think through the experience of it. Like somebody like a data scientist who really just wants access to raw data in a very simplified fashion has a different type of experience than someone in marketing who's really just trying to find the core analytics or a core model that they can apply within their marketing campaigns. 
So you got to think about that experience the same way we think about commerce. You know, like a catalog is just that repository, but you wrap the experience around it based upon the personalization and what that individual is really trying to do within that commerce experience. And then the last key piece of this is the idea of trust. And what we mean by trust is reducing the visibility. So if I don't, if I'm not supposed to have access to the data, don't show it to me. Is it the right data? Is the data itself right? And, and start applying this whole idea of trust around it, which once again, increases the focus and increases the relevancy of the data, as well as in the little green representation in there, is all about bringing in outside data sources. If I have this idea of a broad understanding and the ability of cataloging, it then frees me up to bring in more data from outside or taking this data, because now I have a very broad sensibility around the trust of it, I can really start publishing it externally. And this really allows us to drive much stronger degree of value across the data. And that's what we're, that's what we're really seeing with, with many of our clients. And so what I wanted to really focus on is what are some of the best practices? What are some of the things we're seeing putting out there? Are there tools and techniques that individuals are using to get full advantage of a catalog? And so what, I break it down into really four key areas. I look at it as approach. Once again, keeping it back into, as compared to focusing on the technology, what is the process? What's the model I'm trying to implement? What is the approach I want to take? Where does it start and where does it really end to? The second thing is reach. Am I try who is it I'm trying to reach and do I really understand their experience and trying to get to what they want to get to uh, around that? And how are they thinking through what is it that they really need? Is it raw data? Is it a data set? Is it an analytics? Is it a dashboard? Is it a model? Is it an algorithm? All of these things are data. And then what's really going to help us through is then drive through the idea of value. There's a lot of different ways that people are now starting to think about how do I measure the value? A CEO says, I've heard all about this data. Organizations, whether it be the CDO, the CAO, or a line of business, can you tell me what value my data is having? Because then if I have a good understanding of the value internally, is there a different way now I can take putting an external value on the data I have? And really, and then it comes back into the idea of trust. And I want to take a little different model on trust with you as we're going to go forward. So the first one is the idea of what is the what is a model? What is a, the the what is an approach that I can take? And I you know, like once again, I use this one or you come up with your. But at the end point in time, if our objective is to get the data in the hands of the individual when they need it, how they need it. What are some of the key steps we need to go through? And then, you know, and, and as you're doing this, don't focus around the technology, but think about the process. And we could, like, here's a simple one here. If you marry it against, as you're saying, your data lake model where you got your raw zone, your discovery zone, and your optimization zone. But what is he trying to do? I'm trying to capture. How do I make sure I understand everything that's going into the raw zone? And so there's a request and acquire all the way through to the idea that I can onboard it. Then there is the refinement, how I set up the profiles, you know, like the whole idea. Uh, of, of cleansing and the ability of, of being able to, you know, like put a little bit more of transforming the data so it's a little bit more around the data sets that I'm looking at trying to utilize. But that's only applicable to a subset of users. Then you go start going to the idea of curation. Here's where, where do I really think about the tight alignment with what the business is doing, as well as then my, my EA alignment, my enterprise architecture alignment. And then I start thinking about to who's the owner of the data? How can I really drive the stewardship in thinking of that? Because now I'm trying to get into, I'm, I'm now trying to think a little bit more broadly based around the reach. So I need someone who's going to own it and make sure it's utilized and how it can be utilized. Now I start thinking about enrichment. How do people start adding things, combining data? Start thinking about my analytics processes. I start thinking about if I request, how do I really get very simplify the permissioning of it to provisioning of that data? I've now set my centralized governance because making sure it's not only the data is right, but it's the right data. Uh, and then I start thinking into a very popular approach is crowdsourcing. How do I get, as compared to essentially managing this, how do I get the community as a whole to start thinking about adding insights uh, around quality or, or even thinking about different ways of governing or what should be in, 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 uh, in the environment so that people can access it? Or others like me have looked for this data. Or, hey, I know so-and-so down in the hall was looking for something similar. Let me see, is there a way I can connect to them? So the idea of bringing in the crowd is very important. Then you go into the idea of certification. And this is where you start thinking about the idea of trust. But certification serves two ways. Like it could be a centralized certification where a company says, this is the data you must use. Or it can be the certification of the crowd based upon if 10 out of 10 people said, this is a really good data source for what it is you're trying to do. Different way of building that idea of trust and certification. All the way through to thinking about how am I measuring the impact of my business in how we're utilizing the data. 
wow, this is really being looked for. This is being really being utilized. Let me understand a little bit more, and maybe there's a way we can better refine it to make it even more applicable going to go forward. So the idea of measuring impact all the way through the right-hand side, which I really think is, is, is key, is this idea of broad consumption. And I think this extends even beyond the catalog, where it's you really thinking about different experiences, personalization, people coming in full life cycle about, I requested a data source, I've accessed it, I no longer have access to it. So they think about the whole order management system of around data. All the way thinking through that, we're gonna to get to a point where it's self-service governance. I don't need these, cent these, these centralized teams anymore, that the community as a whole can kind of self-govern itself. So here's just an approach that people use, because once you start thinking about an approach, then they're thinking. That then I start thinking about what is the asset I'm really talking about? What is the definition of data? And I think this is another key point, which we see in catalogs, that a catalog and the processes and the expertise that we're building can be used for many different things, not only around the data and the, and the data sets, but we can use it for algorithms and models and notebooks. And then as you start thinking going forward, what about all the other things, the glossaries and dictionaries around my, my, my company's definitions, as well as then the different metrics definitions that we're putting out there. Now we start thinking about analytics and dashboards and, and different types of um, uh, visualizations that are coming forward. So now as you start pushing even more so to the right, you think about usage analytics, to now being able to take my data and publishing it in different marketplaces where I can even drive more value and more business for the company going forward. When I think about data, and this is one I, you know, I love the debates, is it data, is it information, is it analytics, is it insights? It's all of the above. Pick your, pick your favorite term and go with it. But if you really think about a, a very clear understanding of your approach, and you start aligning the different assets that your organization needs and is looking for, gonna go forward, you'll see that there's many different ways you can approach it. And it'll allow you to figure out, okay, where's the place I can deliver the most value as it is gonna go forward? So then, now that you got your approach and you're, you're, you're thinking through a little bit more uh, broadly based of, that, of what the assets are, now you can align it with where, where, where can I get started? Where can I get focused? Is it, am I really gonna go pick a project around AI and machine learning where it's with a data scientist where they're trying to get the access to that raw data? Well, it tends to be on the left-hand side. As compared to, I really wanna make sure my analytics team is spending too much time trying to find the data or they're taking all the analytics and no one seems confined it, so they keep doing the same analytics over and over again? Or is it we're creating the same analytics like, uh, capabilities in just each of the different pillars of the organization where if they could see what other groups were doing, they can make it more easily build upon each other? Or am I really trying to take a look at, I've got this people who really are not on very, very strong data savvy, but I really wanted to go to this idea of broad consumption. And you can really go all the way to the right. So around this first area around an approach, the first thing is be prescriptive in your approach. Understand a process, don't think about it in regards to technology. That will come secondary once you understand where to focus. The second thing is think about what does data really mean? Uh, and, and it will also really help you to really understand in regards to your approach what you should be focusing on. And then, then think about it, okay, how can I think about mapping this into the various initiatives I have gonna go forward? So that's the first step that I really wanted to, to, to go through as we're thinking about this idea of how do I make catalogs really useful? Because catalogs is a key capability in here, but I really wanna make sure what is the key area of focus I wanna do. The second key area is reach. If we take a look at some of the um, ways we, we've been really thinking about data, and even going back to that data sweet spot, we initially thought about the scientists, we've got the data engineers, and we got the business analysts. That's really where our, our focus has been. But if you think about it, in a broader model of our organizations, there are thousands of other users out there that we have yet to really reach. And that's what I mean, this, this, this idea of broad consumption. It's the person in accounts payable. It's the person in procurement. It's the individual that's, that's working, um, working the warehouse. Like, are there different ways that they can be, the, the ways that they want are looking about and thinking about data? All the way through, if I really extend that even beyond my organization to thinking about at the early outsets, you know, organizations that can provide more data into me, uh, or I can think downstream, my channel partners. Imagine if I could take this data and I could share it with them in a secure, trusted fashion. Imagine what we could be able to really, what type of business we could do. I can get preferential treatment from some of my partners because I deliver them such a great experience that they love doing business with me, that they're willing to share more customers coming into this as we're gonna go forward. And so there's this unmet value as we start thinking about this idea of reach. And so, you know, today, what, you know, one of the ways we encourage this, it's simple as, oh my God, my head is spinning. How, is there a simple way you can really think about this? Well, there are three, three, three core roles uh, as you think about data. There's a data consumer, 
data provider, and then what we refer to as a data, data enabler. So the data consumer is the one who's trying to use and apply the quote unquote data. There's the provider, and many times a consumer provider can be the same thing. And then you have all the teams that really are helping enabling, making this simpler, making it so that we can actually achieve some of the goals that we are going to try to go for. This can be your IT organization, your data stewards, your data governance teams, your data privacy teams, the ones who are ensuring that when we make this data available, that's used in the right way, that it's the right data, and that we're providing a temp, uh, the different technologies to really f help facilitate this as we are going to go forward. Now, most of people can, can really get this down. I, I really get the data side of the house, but when you really want to think about broad consumption of data, really think it through about this, this idea of the business operations person or the business user. Are we talking about you know, like key roles like around business management, HR, customer service and support, your sales teams. Once again, people who aren't really super data savvy, but there's different ways and different ways than what they want to use the data coming forward, or even opportunities that they never realize is possible. How are we do, thinking about in, in regards to our approach to making sure it's accessible to them? And so if you think about this idea of reach and you start applying it against your model, you really not start seeing, okay, I got my project, I got my approach, I'm, I know what I'm trying to get through, I'm starting to get through my initiative. Now I'm thinking differently about which step in my approach is most applicable to the person I'm trying to reach. If I'm trying to work through my, the CAO and CDO, you know, once again, they, they have this broad scope. They're trying to take a look uh, many times mission to try to solve this kind of end-to-end -end process. Whereas your business, you know, the business team, many times where the funding for our projects are coming from, they're not as interested in the front side of it. That's the means to the end. I'm really interested in that end side of the business. Or you got your data scientist, your analyst, or your data governance team. Are we coming? Who's providing? Who's who, who's the, the initial impetus for trying to solve this? And really thinking about where do they fit into your approach? And once again, the idea of reach all the way through to that IT has a very strong role across all different facets of this approach as you're going to go forward. So the second key thing is you got your is the focus around reach. So you have your approach, and now your reach. Now as I'm starting to get an understanding of, okay, how can a data catalog think about solving this? What is, it that, what is it I'm trying to achieve? What is the value? What's the problem I'm trying to really get to? And so that's the idea is you know, thinking about value. But before we do, you're like the idea of this is here's some of the key actions you want to do, understand, map out your citizens, and then re-examine it and the different expectations of those roles. And think about how each, what is the value that each one is trying to get to? Because this is the one where I think we get the biggest stumbling blocks. I get it, I can conceptualize it, but now I gotta go find the funding. Who's got the money to make this real? Logically, it makes sense to me, but how can I get there? And this is the key area. This is, this is really where it, it really comes difficult. Today, we know, and we, there's enough different pieces of research out there that says today it's 80% of the time is spent trying to find the data and only 20% of the time working on the data. Well, great. Now imagine if I could flip that on, on its head. I could say I got 80% of my time is working on a day and 20% on the time um, being able to only find it because that data catalog is just there. It's, I can go get it. Same way we thought about a data. Like, well, the key question is from a business impact, try selling that to your CFO. Look at all this time I gave back to the company. The, where's the dollars? Where's the, where, what's it coming from? How is this really helping me solve some of the broader niches? And some of those initiatives are within marketing. All right, the idea of is that 75% of marketing functions today report marginal return from the digital investments. Well, that's not a good thing. Why? Because we made all these digital investments, we created all this data, but they don't know how to apply it. The next thing is, is, is one I, you know, I really think comes across. Think about your HR department. 70% are increasing their investments in talent analytics, but only 12% are getting results. Once again, we're creating all this data all this insights, all this analytics, but we don't know how to get into the hands of the people so they can apply it back into the models. And this goes all the way through procurement to your insurance functions, all the way through to different sales areas. What is it that these organizations are doing, gonna be able to do with that time? And one of the things we just recently we, uh, completed with IDC is working with a number of our clients is, so if you, if you I got the idea of governance and catalog, what is the type of return of organization you're getting from it? I get it, I, could, I wanna avoid regulations, but is there a way I can think about this a little bit more from an offensive posture? How, what am I doing to co try to go get to new business? One of the things that was very telling is that organizations, and, and many of these projects are small out of the gate, 
But the idea is that it's driving all new revenue opportunities, like 19 million on average across from, from an ROI perspective. 510% ROI, three year ROI payback in seven months, um, the idea uh, of payback around this stuff. That's pretty impressive. And it was funny, you know, Eric, that you, one of the things you mentioned was the idea of billing. One of the, the participants in the study basically said that, that because they were able to do this, had better visibility into the data and the, the quality of it, they were able to spend more time going in there and they found out there was thousands of customers that they weren't billing. And that translated into millions of dollars of unforeseen revenue. Now that's a, that's a value statement. That's a different way that we can really think about catalogs and getting access to data and, and the value that's really coming forward. And the other thing which was really interesting as you think about ROI and combining with this idea of reach is the benefits go pretty broadly all the way through it. So you can see on there from the productivity of your business intelligence and analytics teams. Why? Because they have data and it's trusted. The idea of productivity around your governance teams, and once again, using some of the automation tools so they can once again focus around not, and, and this, this idea of the changing the role of the steward of locking down the data, but looking for new opportunities of sharing the data, data and getting in the hands of the people who need it, all the way through to GDPR and other privacy areas of the idea of increasing the productivity of your regulatory compliance. The one result that I found most intriguing was in the area of the quality of data. I'm being very careful not to say data quality because we know that there's tools out there that look at data quality. But the idea of the quality of data. Obviously on the left-hand side, quality of data, it, I was making it easier to find and it was, the, it was the data that I was looking for. That's on the left-hand side. And you can see some of those metrics. But the other point was when there was an issue in some of the quality, 42% less, less time to resolve those errors. So I'm not spending all the time trying to trace back because there's key elements in there. There's lineage, the idea of where is the data coming from, the idea of I can understand who's the expert, who's the owner of the data in a much more rapid fashion. I can fix the errors as I'm trying to use it in my analytics or I'm trying to take a look at it as I'm trying to create a new model that's associated with the data and it's not working out the way. Let me go get my hands on the access to the, um, to the expert at this. All the way through to the right-hand side, which was less frequent data-related errors. I'm being preemptive of it. I'm fixing the problem before it becomes an issue. What a concept, you know, the reason why we're able to go do this is, once again, I think one of the key areas is in the area of veracity. The fact that we have data and we have multiple versions of the data, but each one's been slightly manipulated, and the idea of it is I used the wrong source because it was somebody called it revenue when it wasn't really revenue, it was a subset of a revenue database. But the idea of, you know, how can I avoid these things before going forward? So once so much so that one organization says because of this idea of the quality of data, that there was millions of dollars of new opportunity created for the marketing team because they didn't have to worry about it, right? It, it was right out of the gate. They were able to increase their segmentation. They were able to create more marketing models associated with it. They were able to drive more campaigns out. This is directly from customers, clients of ours that are going to go forward. So what is the key action out of this? Make sure you think about how you want to measure it. And I think measurements have got to go beyond just the idea of I can save you time got to track it all the way back into the line of business and, and to the business functions that we're trying to implement against. And it comes in many ways. So we've done approach, reach, and value. The last area I want to really talk to you about is trust. And you know, there's so many different ways people talk about trust. You know, can I trust the data? Is it the right data? And right? But one of the things I, I think is really becoming to, a little bit more to the forefront, and especially as we're seeing more organizations trying to think about can I put a financial value on the data I have? Because now my organization's using it much more readily uh, as we go forward. And I'm trying to think about different ways is, you know, like, is my company undervalued without the idea of with all this data? The one thing we have to really remember is that data goes two ways. I have a high degree of trust, people like it, and I get more data. But what happens if that trust level goes down? Well, what we find out is people stop sharing data. So we have to think, if we, if we want to start putting a broader value on our data, we have to really make sure that trust really becomes even more so in the forefront. And some great research I, you know, I thought came coming out of um, like SAP and specifically around some of the global insights. Like the fact that consumers are willing to share data. That's, we know that, you know, I can, and as I mentioned with GDPR, especially with the MARS, if I don't want it, I can want to see how you're doing it and the like. But it's the number one reason why they will stop doing business with a brand is if they lose that sense of trust. And it's even more so that you can see the, the other ideas is that once that trust is lost, that's a willing, I'm looking at reducing up to over a third or even more the business that they do, right, with, with, your, with an organization. 
And why? Because there, there's a contractual relationship here, especially if you think about it from a, from a B2C perspective. As a data consumer, you know, like, as a business, you know, like, I'm a data consumer. I consume the data that comes in from my consumers, right? They are the data providers. They expect three things from me. They expect the idea that I'm going to get some sort, if I share this data with you, I expect some level of value. Is it a discount? Is it a better shopping experience? Right? Some, some level of value. And this is also true from a B2B sense. The second thing is they expect transparency. How are you going to, go, how are you going to use this data? What is it you're going to do? And the third key piece of that is privacy, that you're going to keep my data private. Right, so this, this informal or formal contractual relationship, I think as we're seeing more and more, it's going to become much more of a formal relationship, is key as we're thinking about using a data and how we have to think about catalogs. It's just not about making sure people can find it, but I need to make sure exactly as we're very clear about how we're using the data because the last thing I want to do is break that trust because not only will they share more data with me, but they're going to share deeper levels of data. Is it initially just my name and my address, my telephone number is next, then comes my email address? Well, then I can start doing location-based services. Well, because why? Because I see a value with it, and you're doing a good job of using it in the way you said. And I, you know, I, I like that relationship. I like more and more coming in. So that what you find out is, and this is a, you know, a really interesting piece of work that came out from IBM, what they showed is a very strong correlation. I think they've done it for telco, banking, financial markets, is as trust goes up, so does the willingness to share, a very direct correlation. So what we want to do is we really want to build that trust because I want more data because data has a value. I've now got ways of applying that data going to go forward, and I, want it, and I want a deeper level of data that's associated coming in. Now, as I mentioned, you know, we've got to be careful. You know, like the idea of it is I've, I, you know, like if I have more data, what can I do with it? You know, and it's not saying you always got to go all the way to the right, but I can create new products and services. I can improve my marketing and sales. I can in, I take a look at new services I want to introduce. But if I don't do a good job with it, it goes the other direction. Trust is bi-directional. If I lose it, I can go further. I can go from right to left, right? And so therefore, whether it be improper usage or lack of transparency or the idea, the idea that was failed to protect it. So trust, as you're thinking about in the context of catalogs, is very important. So now we've got this idea, okay, I've gotten a clear view of what is it I'm trying to do from my approach. I'm going to go through and take a look at who's, who's, who's going to be impacted by this, what is it I'm trying to achieve. I've got an idea of what is the value that I want to try. What is the end result I really want to get to? Is it really just time or is it really trying to do these other areas? And I do have at the forefront of my thinking is, like, what is the idea of trust? Can I really get that trust? So now in that model, let's talk capabilities. What are the core capabilities? So if you, earlier in my presentation, I said it comes down to three core areas. It's the idea of you have your core catalog, and you can see the core capabilities make it up there. You've got governance, which provides that level of trust. And I break out, I think it's really important that we think about behaviors and experience differently than just the core catalog. If you just think about all the best you know, e-commerce sites you've ever gone to, was the catalog really good? or was their experience what really set them apart? And I think it's the same way we think about with, with data as we're trying to make this an area. Is it how they search browse? How do they, they really think about finding that data? Do you have crowdsourcing discussion groups? Others like me have searched for something. Right? So the idea of, of really applying a lot of that different consumer-based experiences so you can draw into that broader reach of individuals that you want to look for. As compared to the core elements of a catalog, right? It is including like, this, the same thing. It's tying into your glossary and dictionary, so it's got the broad business alignment. It's a, you know, like, it's got the linkage into the metadata. It's got a broader understanding, so you can understand, so you can really look at the idea of quality. So from a lineage, and you're tying into your data quality tools that you currently got inside. You're thinking about profiling and sampling, and you really want to think about some of the workflows because you want to tie it into why is it there. Who said that this should go into the catalog? So making sure that we keep it manageable, and once again, we don't increase those unforeseen liabilities as they go forward. All the way through to the right-hand side, you think about it. Do, am I locked into from a trust? Do I really ha is it aligned to my company policies? Am I linked into my stewards properly managing and looking at it as we're going to go forward? To the idea of now I'm being able to offer certification. So it's not I have to put five different data sources out there. I can put the one that matters, and I can really help them to, get, to build that idea of trust. And because these things are all connected together, you need to really be able to, and that there, it is a process that we're trying to affect, 
that you need to have broad degrees of integration if you're thinking about different ways of solving it, whether it be for some of the different, uh, for specific industry areas like BCBS or something we mentioned before, the European regulations like GDPR that really is impacting on a global basis. So that's what it's, so if I think about a catalog, that's what I think about a catalog. A catalog is, is the cornerstone, but we have to think about experience and we have to think about trust as we're going to go forward. So how do we, how do we really bring these things together? Let me, how did, how, if we look at capabilities, what is, what should that experience look like? Well, the thing is that everyone's really thinking about is I, I just want to go in there and find. I want to find my data. Well, is that finding of data and analytics or is it data that's not only to my organization, but am I bringing in external data sources like a Nielsen? And then the ability of being able to, if something's not in there, the idea to collaborate with the community as a whole saying, hey, I'm looking for this, or here's a data source I want to bring in. How do I get it brought into the catalog so that it really makes sure so not only myself, but others can take full advantage of? So that's what we think about find. What is that experience of find as you go forward? The next thing is really is making sure you have understanding. And this comes back into what is the data? What does it really mean? Is it, a, is it a level of quality? Where does it come from? What's the lineage of it? Not only from the sourcing of it, but then if I change something from a source perspective, what are all the downstream implications? And this could be data, or it could be how we're calculating, like customer lifetime value. Hey, we're changing the definition of lifetime value. We're changing the calculation. Let me notify everyone who's used this definition as it goes forward, because we have now an understanding of this. And let me notify them how that this is going to impact your analytics, it's going to impact your dashboard. So once again, being preemptive on some of those quality issues that can arise later on as we go forward. And then lastly then is, you know, you come back into trust. And so the idea of trust is making sure it's in, in, in agreement with policies that we have going to go forward, and that we have very clear workflows on how things get handed off so we can better automate this and we can really think about various ways of really scaling this up, always thinking that we have the trust. And that feeds back into the find, because now I have trust. You can certify data. You can make sure it's, it's very easily uh, brought in. I have data sharing agreements, so it makes it much easier for me to bring in data. And now I even think about data sharing agreements now, and now I can easily share it downstream with my, my channel partners. Maybe it's a series of agents that are reselling a portfolio of products, not only mine, but my competitors. And now I can share them more data about customer behavior because you know, I've been able to ensure the privacy. I've been able to mask the identities so that they can do it. And now they understand, wow, this, it's a better experience. I'm more willing to you know, draw, push more business to them because they're able to give me this better experience. And once again, my data becomes that much more of a competitive opportunity as it is going to go forward. So that's a little bit way of how you can think about these core capabilities of a catalog, which is really around finding and understanding that experience that really helps bring it all together. And the idea of that a catalog and governance is necessary. You know, it's not, the, it's the idea of you get the offense and the defense. It's the idea that you have some level of control, but you're really freeing up the data to go forward. That's what a catalog is about. So when someone says, I need a catalog, what is it? That's the way I kind of talk to them about the way of thinking about catalog. What is it you're trying to achieve? You achieve what is the processes and who's all the individuals that are going to be impacted by it? And how do we think about it going to go forward? And we've seen different individuals come at it from different ways. We've seen a top-down perspective. They're coming, driving it from a BI analytics perspective and a top-down. We have Adobe, who's a, 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 great, you know, a great client of ours. And once again, they've got all this customer behavior data, and they want to get it out to engine, whether it be from their marketing campaigns to trying to think about recommendation of new products and services, to even how they think about designing the product. So it's this idea of how do I take all these insights and really drive it from a top-down, from an analytics, you know, I'm going to go down perspective all the way through to Dell EMC, which really is the idea of coming up. I've got the data lake, I've got my master data management solutions, my data warehouses, you take, use your, your, your choice of flavor. Oh my God, no one's using it. How do I really make sure individuals are really taking full advantage of this? Is there a way I can really think of a better way of giving them a better understanding and a better experience so they're more willing to seeing the value of this data that we're now making, making available to them? All the way through to these very specific regulatory compliance areas that we have gonna go forward. So there's different ways that people are coming into this problem uh, depending upon the use case. So let me just, let me bring this together. So if I was to say the key takeaways, and especially as we're thinking about this idea of bringing some of this, this the idea of chaos to all this data landscape and, and how a data catalog can really help you to find your data, you know, I guess where's my data? The three key areas, once again, coming back into what is the core challenge? It's the idea of we got to become much more digital and data is going to be the cornerstone of that. But it's not just about making the data available, it's about the engagement around the data is key. 
The second key piece is, in, as I mentioned, bring, bring chaos to this. A catalog and governance is the right solution. But before you think about it, make sure you focus around your approach, your reach, the value, and your trust as you're going to go forward. And then lastly then is how do you get started, where you want to come in from? Your, your, your journey will vary, but it's going to require you to focus around different types of skills as well as the new capabilities, whether it be capabilities within the catalog or the idea of how I think differently about an experience all the way through that I, I need to, really need to ramp up how I'm thinking about governance because it's, it is going to need to be a cornerstone of what it is that I'm going to go do, go and go forward. So with that in mind, now here's who's Calibra. So who's a Calibra? Calibra is a company that can really help around this. We really do focus around this idea of find, understand, and trust, always in support of the idea of making sure that you, you, you are in looking at it from a data privacy perspective. We are that middle layer in the center that really allows you to reach between all the things you want to do from a BI, analytics, data scientist layer, to your data management. It's the idea of being able to provide that, you know, the, the core catalog, support it by governance, but really thinking about it from a, a data, data experience perspective. What makes us unique is the fact that we're, this, is what, this is how we, we came into market, was maniacally focused in this area. We don't come from a data management sphere trying to grow up or from a tops-down perspective. It really is business user driven. That collaboration between the, the, the end user and the IT enabling organization and all the other supporting roles around it, that's what we're focused on. We, we are truly driven by the process of making sure that this data asset becomes a value to the organization. Take a look across, you, know, you can take a look at your favorite, your, your favorite uh, like um, magic quadrant, wave, whatever it is. We're a leader in, in, in all of them. Why? You know, so, you know, why? Because we have that combined view. We come from the originations of what is the problem that's trying to solve. But it's not only around the technology and some of that, but the idea of the community that we bring together. We have an offer up, come to our website. We have a community of over 4,000 practitioners like yourselves <coughs> that are trying to figure out how to solve these problems. Come to the community, ask them a question, pose a question, see what they're saying, find out what the discussions are coming on. Or the idea is that we also make available a university of online classes. Like if you're not sure where to start, start there. Learn. Learn what others are doing, other clients are doing, or you know, uh, and you can read other, other customer case studies. All the way through to one of the things we always get started is, how do I get started? What's the best practice? I'm not really looking for services, but is there someone who can coach me? So we offer a, a serious diff, different degree of coaching services as it comes forward, all the way through to you know, like the ecosystem of partners. In order to provide this middle layer and trying to think about all these different roles, we have a very expansive partner network that can really help to go in and, and solve the, the various problems. And so with that in mind, you know, like, um, that's a little bit more about like, how we really see, and hopefully like, where's the data, let your data catalog find it. And, but really is about helping you to find it and utilizing a data catalog and governance to get there. So with that in mind, you know, like, um, let me hand it back to Shannon and Eric for some questions. Yeah, you bet. We, we do have some good questions here too. So great presentation, by the way, Paul. I like that you kind of walked us through how we got here and what's really going on and what those key pillars are. And I always like viewing complex issues through some kind of a matrix. You need some kind of a, a management environment, if you will, just for your thoughts you can understand what's going on, and you have to map these things back to your key pillars and to your objectives, right, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, but one of the, these questions is pretty specific, and it's a good one. The attendee is asking, given the examples at the top of the webinar about Department of Defense and organizations that have been around for a long time, how does Calibra work with legacy mainframe systems that use JCL, COBOL, database, stuff like that? <laughs> Well, as, as a thing, I mean, the, the nice part of it is because we're not really dealing with the data, we're dealing with the metadata. Um, the idea of it, and we, we do have a very strong Connect layer, so we use, you know, like, uh, based upon what we call as Calibra Connect, which is based upon MuleSoft. So we have an integration layer, that, that's, and, and we have opened up a number of our APIs. So the idea is there will be some that we custom develop, you know, like, that are come out of the box, AWS, um, Tableau, and some of the others that we're looking at building out, or we have a partner network that would take a look at bringing in those different data sources. And so that would be the way we would take a look at it. We have to take a look at the specific data source uh, and where the metadata is being stored and what's the best way of bringing it in. But we do have a pretty pretty open, open infrastructure to be able to, to address the needs of almost any sort of data that's coming in. But uh, typically, we, we would do this through a business partner. We don't have it initially a direct link into some of those main sources. Oh, I see. Okay, well, that's fine. And you know, in terms of uh, the value here and its comparison to other technologies, right? We've had metadata management tools for decades now, but this strikes me as a sort of supercharged, business user-driven 
navigation technology to help understand and synthesize disparate information systems. Is that is that a fair assessment? I would definitely say, and I think it's about drive. And I think it's the way the measurement's going to be measured as compared, to, as you said, management. I think is one as compared to, I think this is going to be focused around consumption, um, and I think that's how we have to think about looking at it. And it just doesn't stop at at a catalog, which I think is just another way of as you're saying of managing things. But how do we then take it and drive consumption, and what do we measure around it? Hmm. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, good. So let's kind of walk through some other questions here. One of the attendees is asking, uh, kind of walk us through an implementation. Let's say someone decides, yes, I need one of these data catalogs. What does the implementation process look like? How long does it take? Who needs to be at the table? Walk us through how that, all that works. <laughs> That's a pretty broad, you know, typically you start is like, like what, is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You know, like, and, and once again, I, I think many times what we, you know, especially it sounds like we're coming from like a, a very, very open space. I think it comes back into the business definitions and the glossary and glossary and dictionaries um, is really where we see a lot of it starts because you want that industry alignment. Why is it that I'm focused in on this area? What is the alignment back into the business? What are the key data sources that I, that I need that are associated with it? Let me start there. Um, I think that's the best way as compared to I've got all this data. Let me just put it in there. And I'll figure out why I need it later on because what we see is a lot of people that, that don't start from that reason, you get a lot of noise in there. And it, you're already getting into this layer of you're, you're driving up the complexity. If your focus is on, comp, on consumption, think about what the impact is that you're trying to solve, the process that you're trying to solve, and what is it, the core elements of it. Because many times what you want, especially when you get started, is um, start with 100 assets. Start with one key pillar. Start with 100 assets and start with your top, your, your, your key processes. Map those in, and with a workflow, now that you've gotten it, you've proven it out, what you now is the next step is then, as you mentioned before, Eric, is now I either want to work two or three other pillars. Well, you've already got the process defined in your workflow. You just got to extend it. Now I can very quickly go from 100 assets into it to 1,000 assets into it. And then you think about how that can scale you know, you know, from there. But don't, worry, don't think about that I have to go solve the entire organization. It's much different. Start with the alignment into the business, and we typically see that through a glossary and dictionary because that will get your business definitions. And you focus on the priorities, pri uh, prioritization of what assets are important to that, and you use that to then define your initial processes and, and you define them into the workflows. And then you really think about some of the, 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 core, the initial integrations that you need to go, go there. And then it's much easier to scale up from that, that perspective. Interesting. No, that, that's a good answer. And let me, let me throw this one at you. Attendee is pointing out data models and data modeling were not mentioned. Uh, are those not part of the entire data catalog framework like metadata glossary? You just mentioned business dictionary, so that's part of it. But what about data models? Can you ingest those, or how does that work? I, to me, it's just it's the same way. I mean, if you, if you think about what I want to be able to do, a data model should, could be something that I put in there, and it's, it's no different. It's like, well, I need to have, like, who's put it in there, why it's put in there, what's, the, what's all the key elements that I want to manage around it, how do I judge the quality of it, you know, and the like, and basically how can people find it? I think about it, it's very applicable to different ways you can think of, think about it as you're going to come forward. Um, and there's no reason why it can't be included in there. Hmm. Okay, good. Here's another really good question. An attendee is asking, does Calibra help highlight data source design issues, i.e. transactional systems that didn't have proper design to ensure data integrity, cause data anomalies, issues with quality of data, and so forth? Can you give some visibility as you roll out into source systems maybe that uh, have some flaws? Wow, that's an interesting one. I, I, I think what you find out is, you know, like, to your point is, you know, like, once again, since we're very much focused around the metadata and therefore going into the actual data itself, but what you, you'll find out is, I think there's different ways you can do it. If you make it available in there, one is if you think about the crowdsourcing. Your community, the first one that uses it, will, will publish out there saying there's a problem with this. The second thing here is because now if you know who the owner is that's associated with it and there's a quality associated with it, you've also included in there who's the owner of the data, who's the steward of that, is there a way I can immediately find, get in contact with them if I find out that there's issues going to go forward? Additionally, too, as you're going to go forward, you know, because you also include the idea of reference data and sample data and the people being able to see about how it's being utilized and other things it's being utilized with or not being utilized with, that may be another in indicator as you're going to go forward. I think there's, there's different, like, implicit uh, ways uh, that, you know, that the system itself and your approach can really help you to take a look at, at different ways of quality of data as compared to data quality itself, because there's enough tools out there around data quality, and that's not a, an area of focus for us. But the idea of you really want to take a look at it, its usage, individuals uh, around it, 
others that are thinking about utilizing it and, and really is trying to establish that from a much more of a collaborative approach, I think is, will be a little bit more of a core, core um, area for Calibra. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love this concept of data citizens that you talk about. It seems to me this is a great development because if you look at the, the data management environment, especially over the last 20 years or so, and, and even oddly enough, increasingly over the last few years because of this whole Hadoop movement, which required Java programmers to help you even query the data, you, you had this <laughs> tendency for environments to require deep technical expertise with data structures, data management protocols, technologies, and so forth in order to get somewhere, and that made data usage pretty esoteric, or at least uh, high power data management kind of rare, like it was the power user who could do all that stuff. And it seems to me that Calibra is one of these companies that's really pioneering for the role of traditional business users, non-technical necessarily, they could understand some technical stuff, but business users to really be able to wrap their heads around the data that they have, how it connects to the enterprise, where they can get additional data to share, and so on and so forth. So I, I like this concept. Are you finding that, that companies are really resonating with this when they hear this concept of data citizen? I think it's, it's, it's what, the, what organizations are really striving for because it's not only then, you know, as saying is the management of the data, but you really want to understand the ecosystem that you're building up. How is it being utilized? Are there areas that I can look for other areas I can expand from there if I find something that's wildly being utilized. And let me go focus there as compared to it's a splatter gun approach and, and let me think about it. I, let me put it all in there and see what, see what sticks. I think the idea of netting it down and helping to get that initial focus is useful, but then letting user behavior drive where do we go from here. Um, you know, we've got a number of organizations, you know, like Cox Automotive, which once again is growing a lot through different acquisitions. And one of the key challenges is how do I share data across all these different um, all these different businesses so I can really take a look at it as an, an omni-channel problem that we're trying to solve. And the idea of really being able to utilize this idea of data citizens and data citizens across multiple businesses and the like to really take advantage of now that it's become a, a, a part of a, a collective whole and truly breaking down those pillars and those silos of data, I think is, is really what they're trying to get through. And it's, once again, comes from this idea of data citizens and what's necessary for them to go drive the consumption of the data. Okay, I know you talked a little bit about this, but maybe if you could expound a little, the, the roles that bring your technology in and that really get it. You know, chief data officer comes to mind. That's an increasingly popular role. Mm -hmm. What about chief analytics officer or chief operating officer? Is there a, a tendency for one or the other to kind of take the lead here? It, once again, I, I, what we see is it, it depends, upon, depends upon the industry. If you're an organization that is very much already a di very digitally driven, you'll find out that many times we'll come in from that to that chief analytics officer or even from a marketing team because they're very comfortable with the idea and, and, and the broad usage of data. Uh, and they may be that the problem that they're trying to solve is a customer 360, uh, 360 challenge. Where if you're taking a look at those that are a little bit more from a, a little bit more of a regulated industry, a little bit more of a custom development shop, like banking, financial markets, you'll see it will come in through a little bit more of the CDO type of audience. Now they're trying to take a look at how do I, I dr look at it across different parts of the business, always with an eye of privacy and compliance or some other regulation that I initially brought the, brought the focus around to it, but now I'm trying to look at a way of expanding it. I think you see it, it's very industry specific. I mean, it will, it will vary by industry and then also by function. Um, and that's why I, I, you know, it really depends upon who is the champion. I think most of the time, because who sees that purview, if we come back to the idea of the approach, that is either the idea of the CAO or the CDO, uh, tends to be it. Uh, as compared to other parts of the organization, we'll usually see different parts of that, different steps within that and overall approach as it is coming forward. And of course, ID, the idea of IT is really um, a key support function. But even more so now where you're seeing the IT organization trying to think about ways of how do I build privacy into my data ops process, I think you're going to see a much stronger role that the, uh, the, the CIO or CTO will play in this as they're trying to marry this idea of privacy, building privacy up into DevOps. Okay, good. And we're just about out of time, but I'm going to throw one last question over to you. It's kind of an interesting one. It's, let's say it's a curveball <laughs> to end the program here. <laughs> one, one attendee is asking, what about when incoming data is from different sources? For the same data, a validation has been performed on the data at this point and a new additional data source is found, how do you best include yet differentiate that source in the trust portion? 
to avoid cost. And this kind of gets back to single version of the customer, right? Like multi omni channel type stuff. Can you talk to that very quickly? Well, I, I think the idea is, you know, the, the idea that there's there's no single version of the truth, as compared to multiple versions. As long as there's, there's multiple versions, as long as they're trusted, as long as it's clearly defined and it's, and the person looking for it understands what's been done from it and a broader understanding, whether it be through the tagging or the uh, the idea of, of other information that's provided around it, that's okay. And that's one of the things that we're seeing is it's okay to put it out there if there's a need for it, and as well as it's broadly understood. And therefore. I know if I'm using it, I have a very clear set of expectations around what's happened to the data and what I should be using it for. Uh, so this idea that there is like that there's only one version of the truth that's not that, that's not going to work. There are multiple versions of truth, but you know, but the idea is that is as long as I can trust it and it's a very clear understanding why I can trust it and and if I do have any questions where I can go through and source it, that's what we're seeing more uh, more and more happen. That is you know, and, and I think that's the idea of. Don't focus around consolidating all down, but making sure if there are different versions, understand why, and that comes back into the lineage and what was what, what was done to the data, and why is why why is it being put in there? So the business alignment is also critical as it, as it goes forward. Yeah, that's great stuff. Well, let me hand it back to Shannon. We went just over an hour, but great, great stuff, great answers. So a lot of great questions. Thank you to the audience for those wonderful questions, keeping both of us on our toes. Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Paul, for uh, this great presentation and information. And as Eric mentioned, thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Friday for this presentation to all registrants with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session, and uh, Paul's and Calibra's information. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care, folks.